Okay. Um, I think in terms of, um, I think basically the, the, there are two things that have been very important for, for our conception of humanity. Especially if we think about the human as a distinctive kind of creature. Because all, uh, all the cosmologies of the world um, you know, talk about nature and, and, and change and creation and all of this. Um, but it's really in the, uh, it's in the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, where you have a privileged conception of what the human is, uh, which has to do with uh, having been created in the image and likeness of God. Um, and so that then sets up, you might say, the premise for thinking that we can be more than we actually are. Because if we are in some sense, you know, the direct offspring of God, then there is a lot, long way to go before we actually realize that full potential. And, and this is where the theological tradition, with its conception of original sin, uh, is, is, is actually was very motivating for people because there's a sense in which we're in a fallen state. We could be gods, but we're not, so we have to self-transcend. Uh, and um, science has been the kind of the main way in which we've in fact actualized this. And it's not surprising that the scientific revolution in Europe in the 17th century were caused by a bunch of dissenting Christians who basically took the Bible into their own hands and saw this idea that we're created in the image and likeness of God as speaking directly to them. That they are in a position to understand the whole framework of creation. That they can think God's thoughts. They can inhabit the mind of God, to use a phrase that's still used by physicists today. And it seems to me that that then starts the trajectory toward the idea that human beings can both understand and master potentially the entire universe. Um, and it seems to me that transhumanism takes this story very seriously and carries it to the next level, uh, taking into account the more recent developments, certainly uh, you know, w since the rise of uh, artificial intelligence, since the rise of molecular biology and biotechnology, the, uh, the possibility of our, in a very deep kind of way, re-engineering ourselves to be able to increase our capacity to actually do all these things that ultimately has this kind of theological basis in terms of us being a kind of privileged species. Um, and that is uh, basically the, the general story that I tell uh, ab about where transhumanism comes from. Uh, because I do think, the, re the reason why I think it's worth telling the story, by the way, is because I think it, re it, it relieves, it gets rid of a lot of the tr science fictional kind of air to the idea. Because I think a lot of people um, think of transhumanism as science fictional because they have a hard time motivating the idea that we ought to be these super creatures, right? I mean, there are a lot of people who are perfectly happy being human beings and actually think it's quite a struggle to be a human being. And they look at all the other the problems in the world that come from having too many human beings and how we haven't solved problems of poverty and all this kind of stuff. And so I think for those people, uh, it's very hard to motivate. Why would one want to be engaged in this massive self-transcendence project that involves actually taking enormous amount of risks, both on behalf of oneself and the entire planet? And I think that's where this bigger story becomes very important. Because in a sense, our self-definition uh, of ourselves as a species has been very intimately tied to what transhumanism is pursuing now. Okay, I mean, the business about race and religion as the twin taboos, um, in a sense, this is one of the things that has always, uh, you might say, uh, placed a, a boundary with regard to our using science to understand human beings. Um, I mean, the issue of, re of religion is uh, the idea that, uh, in a sense, it's this divine entitlement I was talking about earlier that actually enables us to understand the world as it is. And so the argument would be that unless you have the right theology, you really can't do science properly, okay? Because in a sense, what it means to be a divine creature, you know, who has, who's created the image and likeness of God, is something that theology gives us the answer to. But of course, in the modern era, this has been problematic, uh, not so much because uh, theology has been refuted, but rather because there are so many different theologies around, right? And, and that in a sense, to privilege any particular theology is actually a very strong political act. Uh, uh, and and uh, you know, as you know, with any sort of notions of established churches and so forth in countries, um, and so uh, that's always, so there's been a kind of taboo in the modern era where we respect a kind of plurality of opinions that we actually do not, you know, allow science to be strongly enmeshed with these theological discussions. 
Okay. On the other hand, the taboo of race, I think, is a more straightforward one. And it's one that actually comes out of science in terms of the results of science, you might say. Um, because um, racism, while racism can be found in all cultures, um, you actually get a scientific basis for racism that then ends up fueling very, sorts, very strong political agendas in the 19th and 20th centuries. And this has a lot to do with the recognition that becomes you know, increasingly strong as, as Darwinism becomes important in biology of the variety of different sorts of species. And a species doesn't exist as a monolithic essential thing, but rather it exists in many variations, each of which are adapted to the environments they normally inhabit. And indeed, Darwin himself described race as a subspecies. Okay? Now, this sort of thinking, um, of course, then leads to justifying all sorts of political divisions and conflicts and things of that kind. And one of the things that happened after World War II especially, where racial politics played such a prominent role, was that the UNESCO, uh, the uh, scientific wing of the United Nations, uh, established this Declaration on Race in 1950 which basically, as a, as a kind of a rule, or as a matter of fiat, um, basically said race had nothing to do with the human condition, that race is not a biologically acceptable category, but is just a political distinction, okay? And so we've basically been living under that kind of legal understanding for a long time, so that any racial divisions have usually been seen as invidious, okay? And not a proper basis for any kind of policy, because it's supposedly not underwritten by science. Now, while I do not believe that we are going to go back to the old racism, which was based on a false biology, very coarse-grained understanding of genetics, things of that kind. Nevertheless, uh, as we understand more and more about the human genome, as we understand the genealogy of the human condition out of Africa into the many different directions in which it's gone, and we will undoubtedly see, and we're already beginning to see, the way in which certain diseases, certain kinds of conditions, especially physically-based conditions, are tied to certain kinds of genetic makeups. Okay, so in a sense, we can do as it were micro racial distinctions, right? Not macro racial ones, where as it were a given race has an entire inventory of properties, but rather you can start saying, well, you know, this group of people who share this kind of gene are prone to have this kind of condition, okay? Um, and that will be increasingly important uh, for reasons of uh, medical judgments and maybe even for certain kinds of legal judgments when we talk about criminal responsibility and things like this. So alcohol susceptibility, for example, or something of that kind. Okay? And this could easily lead to, as it were, different policies for different kinds of people. Okay? So in that respect, um, it seems to me as science develops, we are going to be revisiting uh, both the religion and the racial side uh, of the divide. So in a sense, the taboo will drop. Uh, but, but there will be a, a greater and greater scientific uh, basis for the ones that will come on stream. There's a sense in which we've always been moving beyond the baseline of the biological human being. Um, and I think something like, like writing is really a big step forward in the sense of creating a sort of prosthetic extension of thought, essentially, uh, and allowing for collective memory uh, and also for a certain kind of standardization of what people think and how are they to respond. Uh, because basically what, what writing does is it turns thought into part of the external environment that conditions us. So thought is, is no longer a private thing, but becomes a kind of public artifact, essentially. Um, and, um, and also an external marker of identity as well, as the various forms of writing differentiate themselves into specific languages. Okay. Um, and that, you know, the Greeks are very important in this regard with regard to distinguishing languages and associating them with particular cultures and, and you know, so in other words, having a self-understanding of oneself as being part of a distinct culture, okay? And all of that gets us beyond the humanity, you know, the, the, the homo sapiens humanity and, and enables people to start thinking of themselves as part of larger groups and not only as part of larger groups, but as also as participating potentially in a historical project. Right? Because you are speaking a language that your ancestors spoke, that you, know, you contribute literature that other people have contributed to, uh, and it's part of this kind of stream of a certain, uh, you might say, uh, form of human existence that transcends the lifespans of any particular individual. So your works live after you, basically. Right? Um, and, and this is incredibly important, I think, um, in terms of providing a kind of a continuity uh, if you think of the way it's functioned in the 
you know, again, think about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as people of the book, okay? The, 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 the use of the book and of writing as the kind of cornerstone by which human identity is tied uh, actually enabled these people to kind of move across many great spaces over great periods of time and nevertheless retain a kind of continuity. So in other words, the human can then turn into a kind of super organism, you might say, that is united by several generations over several continents. Okay? Uh, that's, a very dis that's a very important thing. That's quite different from saying there are pockets of Homo sapiens living in different parts of the world, which is kind of how it originally was right, prior to writing. Now you can talk about a kind of common, you know, kind of homogeneous culture where people from one part of the world can actually you know, travel somewhere else and be able to communicate with them effectively as if they'd always been together. You see, that is one of the ways in which the human beings have extended themselves. And of course, we, you know, with technology, that even you know, gets amplified even further because we can actually transport ourselves and other aspects of our being, our products and so forth, much more quickly, uh, and then create you know, a common global network, you know, the sort of thing Marshall McLuhan called the, net, the global village. Uh, that, and that is, that is a way in which you might say humanity starts to live a kind of enhanced existence where I'm no longer relying simply on what's going on in my own brain or the brains of the people I'm in direct contact with, but rather I can draw upon the entire storehouse of what everybody else has done through artifacts like writing, books, technology, things of that kind. And in that respect, I can be enhanced by the intelligence of all the people who've come before me. And this is a very distinctive human thing, okay? And I think that the whole transhumanist project has to be understood as coming out of that tradition. Okay, uh, and what transhumanism does is in a way to maybe accelerate, amplify, maybe in a certain way make more efficient this general process okay, uh, that we've been seeing over the course of human history. Well, first let me say that um, I think the idea of the singularity is not, is, let's put it this way, it, it is a concept that I think has a very strong, um, a strong basis in uh, Western theology, actually. Uh, and, and when I think of somebody like Ray Kurzweil, I would put him as very much the kind of person who I think is drawing, I think rhetorically and probably intellectually, from this whole idea of some kind of ultimate omega point where uh, our full potential comes to be realized all at once, right? And, and as it were, everything that humanity has been building up to over the last several billions of years comes into, into being, where all potential is suddenly realized. Uh, and um, I can see, I mean, there's a sense in which, so, so in other words, that kind of motivation, which uh, I associate uh, with uh, what uh, you may know, the, uh, the, there is this person uh, who wrote a lot about uh, the, this kind of cybernetic side of transhumanism uh, uh, 15, 20 years ago named Eric Davis, who coined the phrase technosis, right, from Gnosticism, which was the, uh, the heretical sect of Christianity from the early period, which basically was arguing that um, the point of our human existence is to escape our bodies as fast as possible and to come reunited as spirits with God, right, to get to the God point and that that would be the only way in which we would overcome original sin. And so uh, these people often did some very curious things. Uh, some of them, in fact, did experiments where they tried to, in fact, get into the mind of God and so forth, but others engaged in all kinds of acts of violence and overthrowing established authorities that, in a sense, were trying to keep people grounded on Earth. I mean, there were all kinds of radical movements. I see singularities very much in line with this, only from a very sort of technologically driven side. Um, I think also, one, one has to say that the science policy agendas of the world to a large extent encourage a singularity style thinking at least in so far as uh, you know this whole idea of the converging technologies the idea that we're in some sense trying to harness the sciences to work with each other to as it were mutually benefit from each other because that in itself will end up expediting progress with regard to ex enhancing the human condition so even though these people these policymakers aren't working with the relatively short timeline that Kurzweil is working with, nevertheless they have the same general picture, which is a picture of all the sciences increasingly being in synchrony with each other, and as they work more and more together, they will in fact expedite the rate of progress, which then will enable human beings to improve themselves faster and faster. <laughs>
Okay, and this will lead to a more efficient, more productive kind of future. Um, so, so that is that consciousness is there, um, and and I also have to say that uh, I think uh, the uh, the way is being prepared mentally for this kind of future, and um, you know I, I I'm in the sociology of science, formally speaking, and a lot of people in my field have been hired to do research on people's attitudes toward this kind of. Uh, changing worldview, you might say, that, that is looking toward a sort of enhanced future where all, all the sciences and technology are converging together to this one point where, where we, you know, this omega point. Um, and what this research shows is that a lot of the uh, marketing that's going on for goods and products, a lot of the movies, a lot of the entertainment people uh, are consuming these days are all providing what people in my field call anticipatory governance toward this possible future. In other words, people are being primed. They're being basically taught to expect, taught to want this kind of a future of a singularity, it seems to me. So even if it doesn't come about in the kind of pure form that Kurzweil is imagining, nevertheless it seems to me that we are developing a culture now that is very receptive to this as, as, as it were, the default setting for humanity, that we are in fact moving in that direction. And I think this is quite, quite striking in a way, uh, because um, if you actually look at the way in which the sciences have developed historically, um, generally speaking, sciences have tended to subdivide and pluralize and move in many different directions using lots of different methods, coming up with lots of different results. And in fact, it's only been when you've had policymakers and philosophers and other visionaries trying to harness it and bring it together in a focus that it's actually moved in a unified direction. But the default tendency is toward pluralization, toward diversification, very much like evolution, right? Um, and, and what, and what uh, Kurzweil is calling for, and which I think, as I've been saying, is being backed up to a certain extent by both the policy community and the wider culture, is a kind of focusing, a kind of converging right, to this kind of special direction in which humanity realizes its full, full potential. So I think as a kind of cultural movement, uh, I think it's, it's worth taking seriously, actually. Uh, whether his specific predictions about all the, you know, the, the rate at which intelligence will develop and self-replicate and all that, whether all that's going to come true, I don't think that's really that important with regard to the general worldview that's being promoted here which I think a lot of people have already bought into. I mean, I think it's quite striking, and, uh, is that if you look at the Singularity University in California, which Kurzweil has started, um, the main thing that's being taught there is marketing, it seems to me, right? And business skills. Because whatever else is gonna happen in the short term with regard to the Singularity, it has become enough of a recognizable cultural value that a certain kind of group of people in society you know, with a lot of disposable income, as it were, uh, relate to and identify with, that in fact you can sell a lot of things on the back of the singularity, okay? Uh, and I don't mean this in a purely cynical way. I actually think there might be some very interesting kinds of innovations that'll come about that'll actually be genuinely, genuinely quite useful. But I think what singularity has succeeded at is to be a kind of marketing hook, okay? Uh, in other words, to give people a certain way of seeing their lives, okay? Very much like, a, in a way, a kind of updated version of the kind of hip lifestyles of the 1960s, which were also portrayed as being very futuristic and so forth. Um, I think, in a way, singularity may provide that kind of worldview covering for our time. Um, and I think that'll exist quite independently of whether his predictions come true.